phrase this way, your unfailing love, O Lord, is as vast as the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches beyond the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Your justice like the ocean depths. You care for people and animals alike, O Lord. How precious is your unfailing love, O God. All humanity finds shelter in the shadow of your wings. You feed them from the abundance of your own house, letting them drink from your river of delights, for you are the fountain of life, the light by which we see. Pour out your unfailing love on those who love you. Give justice to those with honest hearts. Don't let the proud trample me or the wicked push me around. Look, those who do evil have fallen. They are thrown down, never to rise again. Amen. Verse 5, your unfailing love, O Lord, is as vast as the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches beyond the clouds. I'm going to lift up uh, for this message and this service today on worship. Worship makes the difference. Look at your name and say, worship, worship. makes the difference. You can be seated in the presence of our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is the Christ, on this Lord's Day morning. Beginning to think about this particular passage of Scripture, looking at what is taking place. Psalm 36, of course, we recognize psalms are songs, also prayers that are going out to God, speaking of his goodness and also of the trials that many go through. When we look at this particular psalm, it seems that David, of course, of course, y'all know David, right? Seems to be that David, once again, is in a situation that he is running, fleeing for his life. We don't know what particular, as you look at many scholars, may come up and begin to find what he's actually going through at this moment. One thing we do know, he had many trials. He had many times of battle. He also had a time when he had to run from Saul. He had to run from Saul so many times, he ended up finding himself in a cave. Uh, we don't really know. Scholars are debating, it depends on who you read, what David is really going through. But if he is in a cave at this particular time, then there are some things that he seems to be writing from his cave. He's beginning to express, and we see these things pinned here in Psalm number 36. Yeah. Psalm number 36, we're dealing with particular aspect of worship. We look at worship. Worship has many different aspects to it. And we want to con concentrate today in verses 5 through 12 on adoration. Adoration. The word adoration is from our word adorare. When we look at this word adoration, we have to understand if we're going to worship, what we're simply doing when we're adoring God, we're affirming God's attributes. Somebody say affirming. Affirm. God's attributes. In other words, if we want to look at the word affirm, we look at the word affirm, it means to maintain as true. Maintain as true. It also means to express agreement with or commitment to. It means I'm going to express agreement with. In other words, I agree, but also I'm going to express commitment to. I'm going to follow that. I'm, I'm in. You count me in. I'm, I'm expressing uh, God's, I'm expressing about adoration of God. I agree that we adore God, but then also I agree we need to commit to the God we're adoring. So we're looking at affirming, but then we're looking at attributes. If I'm going to affirm God's attributes, Attributes. How do I need to understand that? What the word attribute simply means, consider as a quality or characteristic of the person in question. Uh, it's considered as a quality or characteristic of the person in question. So when we affirm God's attributes, we are maintaining, we're expressing agreement, we're committing to the fact that he is the person we're talking about. And we have to understand he is a quality person. And when we understand affirming his attributes, in this text today, we want to pull out a few things so we can make sure that worship can make the difference in our situation. How many want worship to make the difference in your life? 
Well, first of all, if we're going to do that, I'm going to give you these three things. A few, should I say these few things? We'll have our little Easter speech. We'll sit down and we'll be done. First of all, we want to have, first of all, if worship is going to make the difference, there must be an observation. Let somebody say observation. And after you make an observation, then there must be adoration. Let the church say adoration. And after you have adoration, now there also must be supplication. Somebody say supplication. But after you have supplication, you can't have that without a celebration. Let somebody say celebration. But all that's no good unless you end it with application. Uh, let the church say application. And first of all, we have adoration. Next we have, what's next, y'all? I need you to be a good church. We're in the city of UT, Texas, the Longhorns. Let's start again. If worship is going to make the difference, first of all, there must be a what? And after you have observation, you must have what? And after adoration, you must have some what? And you end that with some what? Oh, but it's no good unless you have. Can we walk through this text real quick? When we look at this text today, we can see here Psalm number 34. There, first of all, in verses 1 through 4, the psalmist makes an observation. And let's look at this observation that the psalmist makes here in this text. Verse, 30, verse 1 says, Sin whispers to the wicked deep within their hearts. They have no fear of God at all. In their blind conceit, they cannot see how wicked they really are. Everything they say is crooked and deceitful. They refuse to act wisely or do good. They lie awake at night hatching sinful plots. Their actions are never good. And they make no attempt to turn from evil. I mean, here's what makes the observation that's taking place. What the psalmist is doing, what he's doing is simply looking and making an observation. He says, you know what? As I'm sitting here, I might be in this cave. I might be running. I might be in my situation, running away, trying to protect myself. But here's something I've noticed while I'm sitting here in my cave. One thing I've noticed is I'm a child of God. And since I'm a child of God, there are some things I've observed in my walk with God. Everybody don't think like me. Matter of fact, what his observation really is, Pastor Clark, is the wicked don't respect God. And they don't just respect him. They don't even know God. And since they don't respect him or know him, here are some things that takes place. Sin keeps whispering in their ear. Sin is whispered in their ear and it also whispers in, it, in their ear and now it begins to take root in their heart. Be careful who you let in your ear. Whoever's in your ear has influence to your heart. He says sin whispers in their hearts, in their ear and in their hearts. It says they have no fear of God at all. I mean it sounds like as you read this text his observation is starting to get him upset. Check out what he says. In their blind conceit. They cannot see how wicked they really are. He said, these people are so foolish and so crazy acting, they don't even know how crazy they are. You ever been around somebody like that? I mean, they just the devil. Don't even know they the devil. I mean, I mean, they just as crazy as it can be and don't even know how sinful they are. He said, man, this is, it, it, it's crazy how wicked they are and they don't even recognize. Then verse 3 says, everything they say is crooked and deceitful. If they ever tell you something, make sure you go check on it. Oh, y'all ain't got nobody like that around you. I mean, if they tell you something, then you be like, for real? Let me call Charles to verify what you said. I mean, everything they say. I mean, my mama would say they got diarrhea of the mouth. I mean, it's just like they can't keep nothing in, and when they bring it out, it's just a bunch of mess. I'm trying to help somebody. I mean, you got certain people you can't trust, nothing that comes out their lips. He says, guess what? They're deceitful, and they're crooked. And then it says they refuse to act wisely. I mean, here's the deal. To refuse to act wisely means you know how to. And here's what we're dealing right now is with rebellion. He said this is a group of people, they just so rebellious. I mean, they see the line and they end up stepping across it anyway. I mean, it says, you know what? I just want to be me because guess what? I'm I-N-D-E-P-E-N-D-E-N-T. Do you know? 
I'm about said. I'm going to do me. Our culture is all about us and not about God. And when we look at it, he says, these are some rebellious people. If you look in the Bible, first, in first Samuel chapter 15, Samuel says that rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. He said, oh, you don't need no broom and to fly across greater Mount Zion to be a witch. He said, you could be a witch by always pulling tricks and trying to end up messing up and not doing what God says to do. And what he says here, he says, rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. He says, he says, I'm making this observation. They refuse to act wisely or do good. They lie awake at night hatching sinful plots. They can't sleep because they're trying to figure out how they're going to get somebody next. Oh, I saw that Facebook post. I'm just going to think of one all night because I'm going to get them in the morning. I'm going to get them. I'm going to get them. I'm going to get them. I wish they would. I, I got some for you. Oh, you, I, I, oh maybe you're looking like that because you're the one I'm talking about. Uh, you know how somebody gets you. You be like, uh-huh. Oh, okay. Okay. You want to be like that? You want to be like that? And then you can't rest until you get your plan together and your comeback. He says, you know what? They sit up hatching sinful plots all night long. They can't even sleep right. Can I just give you an observation real quick. Somebody right now lost sleep because they can't stand you. <laughs> See, some people make you important when other folk didn't know your name. And here's the whole deal you got to say. Don't worry about how people talk about you. That's just free advertisement. Matter of fact, you ought to just give them a dollar. Say, you know what? I'm so glad because you're the best PR agent I ever had for free. A am I talking to somebody right now? Oh, go on and talk about me, because some folk didn't even know my name till you put it in it. And by the time they come and see me, they're going to say, I ain't what you said I was. Matter of fact, it's like a Queen of Sheba situation. The half has not been told. <laughs> High five your neighbor, say, let them talk about you. Let them talk about you. It's free publicity, better than TMZ. It's better than Jet. It's better than Ebony. It's better than the news. It's better than anything. <laughs> let them lay awake at night. Figure out how you about to make me popular. <laughs> he says, they refuse to act wise. They'll do good. He says, they lay awake at night hatching sinful plots. Their actions are never good. I mean, not, not no never. <laughs> and they don't make an attempt to turn from evil. I mean, they can be there acting like they trying to turn, but they really ain't trying to turn. They might be trying to turn you out. But they ain't trying to turn away from their sin. And the observation he makes, he begins to look at that. He gets upset, it seems, about these wicked people. I mean, here's what he's saying. And that's what I'm saying to you. If you love somebody and somebody is doing bad toward them, wouldn't it make you upset? Okay, let me take a little further. If somebody says something about your mama. <laughs> Uh, see, see how you got there right there? <laughs> see, some of y'all don't even like your own mom. You're like, let them talk about it. I don't care. <laughs> I mean, if somebody says something about somebody you love, don't it really bring something out of you? I mean, there's a couple of things you just can't mess with. You can't mess with my money. You can't mess with my family. Uh, you can't mess with my God. And what the psalmist is doing here says, you know what? I'm upset because these folk won't even do God right. They disrespect God. And here's the whole deal. This society disrespects God all the time. And listen, if somebody is in the family of God, if he's your daddy, can I got somebody right now to stand up for your daddy? And say, listen, you can talk about all you want to. Matter of fact, you can invite me down to your little party. You can invite me down to do the prayer at your little event. But listen, when I come, I'm bringing my God with me. When I say in the name of, I ain't going to say Allah. I ain't going to say Buddha. I ain't going to say Krishna. I'm bringing Jesus. Y'all and everybody else. And so listen, if you want me at your party, you got to bring my God. To, oh, I ain't got nobody right now. Wherever I go, I got to take him with me. Meet me at the, at the, at the club is going down. Meet me at Walmart is going down. Meet me at GMZ is going down with my Jesus. See, look at that. Y'all didn't want the club part because you recognize some Christians still in the club. Quit tripping. That's why you was had to come to 10 instead of 8 this morning. Here we go. Now we see observation. Somebody say observation. But not just an observation. Here now, he moves now into adoration. Somebody say adoration. 
Well, first of all, we got to understand what the word adoration means. In the definition, the Latin, it simply means to speak to. Uh, adoration means to uh, speak to. It also means to do homage or entreat. Uh, it's really a kingdom term. If you had to live in a kingly society to understand, you, you speak to and you do homage or you entreat. You, you basically, here it is, worship. Uh, it's from that Latin word oris, which deals with the mouth. Uh, it, it also gives the, the connotation that when you are worshiping, when you are adoring, it simply means you kneel, you stand, or you kiss the hand of the one you're in front of. Let me say it again. You kneel, you stand, or you kiss the hand of. I mean, here, here's basically when you come into a presence of a king, you either kneel before the king, or, or you stand when the king comes in, or you stand when the authority figure comes in or when you come down you got to kiss the ring of the king who's in front of you it's a matter of respect basically what that word simply means is proskuneo uh, adoration needs here it is it needs though you can't just do all this it needs an object and when you talk about worship there's only one true person who's worthy of adoration do you know who this person is? Uh, the, the psalmist talks about Jehovah or Elohim or Yahweh is the only one who is worthy of all, our name, all of our praise and all of our worship. Now, when we look at this, we got to see when he's adoring, what, what is he adoring? Who, how is he adoring? What is he? When we start talking about adoring, we're talking about God's attributes. I'm talking about not just what he's done. I'm talking about who he is. Uh, I, I'm worshiping. Somebody say worship. Praise is usually for what he's done. Worship is for who he is. Uh, it's intimacy. Uh, we got to understand it's intimacy. And intimacy simply means in to me, see? See, a lot of people can't be intimate with God because they're into themselves so much. They worship themselves so much that God is saying, are you into me? See, you praise me for what I do, but are you into me for who I am? See, we got a whole lot of spiritual prostitutes in the church. Oh, see, here's the whole deal. You ain't got to walk down 12th or 6th Street to see some prostitutes. A prostitute has a mindset. A prostitute's mindset is, I want something from you, but I don't want you. And many times, Christians come to church, they want stuff from God. God, bless me with my job. God, bless my family. God, bless this. God, bless that. But at the end of the day, we don't want the God when he comes down for us walking with him. But when you are worshiping God... I wish I had a prayer in church right now. When you're worshiping him, you have to adore him. And here's some of the attributes that, that he show, he's showing us here. Look at, look at, look at verse 5. Verse 5 begins to show us, after he makes his observation, he says, first of all, I have to worship God because here it is. He's an unfailing lover. He's an unfailing lover. Okay, you know, understand unfailing lover? Here's what he says. Verse 5, your unfailing love, O Lord is as vast as the heavens. He, he's an unfailing lover. Okay, you don't understand what unfailing lover means? Well, he's talking about an unfailing lover. He's talking about God's goodness, God's kindness, God's mercy. And then God, here it is, we start talking about mercy and kindness. God bends down low to be benevolent. Okay, here it is. God had to stoop down to your level to bring you up to his. I'm trying to help you. He says, God, you are an unfailing lover. He said, because I've been in love with a lot of people and they all fail me. And that's why the Bible says, guess what? Love never fails. People fail at love. Let me just drop something to my sister or my brother right now. Listen, how can you say Say you're in a relationship with somebody who loves you when they don't love God. Check it out. God is love. If God is love and they don't have a relationship with love, relationship with love, how are they gonna end up loving you if they don't love love? I'm trying to help somebody. You can't really have the love God has for you if you don't. But do I have somebody right now who knows God is an unfailing lover? That, that's what that's what that's what he's talking about. He says God is an unfailing lover. He's, his goodness, his kindness, his mercy, he bends down low and shows benevolence. But he didn't just stop there. Let it be. He says, I, I, I ain't just adoring him because he's an unfailing lover. I'm adoring him because he's faithful. 
Okay, you missed that in the text. He says, I'm adoring him because he's faithful. Look at, look at, look at, look at part B, uh, verse 5. Verse 5, your unfailing love, O oh Lord, is as vast as the heavens. I'm trying, Mom. I'm trying. Your unfailing love, O oh Lord, is as vast as the heavens. Check it out. Your faithfulness reaches beyond the clouds. Okay, he's adoring him, first of all, because he's unfailing love. Also, underneath that adoration, because he's faithful. Okay, we look at the word faithful. Uh, word faithful means consistency. <laughs> okay, okay. It, it means he can be trusted to keep his promises. Oh, it's good. The psalmist is saying, you know what? God, you're faithful. You're, you're consistent. You can be trusted to keep your promises. Uh, but guess what? Not just that. Your faithfulness is limitless. Okay, let me turn it to you again. Let me prove it to you. He says in the text, your faithfulness reaches beyond the clouds. See, some folk, we can trust them as far as we can see them. He says, God, I can trust you as far as I can't see you. Okay, you missed that. You are so faithful that even when I can't see past the clouds, all I know is when I can't see you, you're going to be faithful on the other side. That's, that's what he's saying. He says, your faithfulness is limitless. I wish I had to church somebody just say limitless. He, he says, there is no limit to how faithful you'll be. Faithfulness is not what you do. Faithfulness is who you are. And he says, guess what? I, I, you're an unfailing lover. You're faithful. You keep your promises. But not just that. I, I, I'm adoring you because of that. those two. But here's the third reason I'm adoring you. Because of your righteousness.